Hey, what's up? This is Laid Back Luke, DJ and producer, Kung Fu athlete, and dedicated dad. I am so, so sorry. I promised you a Denon DJ controller vlog this week, but then I had the okay coming in from Afrojack and his team to come by and shoot this very special vlog. This is going to be very juicy stuff, but before we dive into it, shout out to the comments of last week. Number one comment by AdFaithR and such a sweet comment. Thank you very much, dude. I really appreciate it. I, uh, I'm happy you see that I'm real and I'll always keep it real. And I'm so happy you enjoy the vlogs like all you that are watching right now. And thanks to Zach Yutzi for the second comment uh, of last week. You don't need more tutorials. And next week will be a new In My Mind tutorial of me on a DJ controller. The moment is here. The truth about the pre-recorded sets in the, the DJ top 10, or like all the big DJs on the main stage festivals. Let's find out the truth right here, right now. Just arrived in Afrojack studio. I'm very excited to be here. We're gonna uh, interview him today. He wants to explain a couple of things today. So let's go in. Yay. Welcome to my studio. What's up everyone? We got Legback Luke in the house. So uh, we're here to, to solve some issues, I guess. Uh, well, we don't have any issues, but there's a, a lot of things online uh, about DJs and what DJs do. And I remember firing out this tweet, uh, you know, condemning people uh, with uh, like playlists and everyone. Zed jumped into the conversation, but Afrojack. What did he well, say? Well, <laughs> hey, <laughs> the hi, whole friend said, hi, but... hi, Zed. No, no, he he was very he was very honest about it, and he said he has a, a a set list, a playlist that he uses every single night. And my reply to him was, well, then in my opinion, you're not a DJ, but you're an artist or you're a band. Now I know you, you're a real DJ. I've known you coming up. Well, if I want to be. <laughs> Coming up, working your way up, playing shitty clubs, playing every single night. There's two perspectives, like you said. You have what Zed does, which is proper preparation, which allows for an amazing other feat to be accomplished when you look at live production. And there's the other extreme, which is you, which is like freestyle DJing and some DNC stuff here, a little bit of scratching, like next level. Sh the way I do it, like it's in the middle. So when I have to play Tomorrowland, I have an hour to play. And if I don't plan it properly, it could be that I forget to play 10 feet tall. If going into that, being a respected artist, being booked on such a high bill with so much marketing and promotion, it is sort of your responsibility to those fans and to Tomorrowland to prepare a set that will give them everything they could expect of you as an artist. How does that work? So does this mean in, in an hour set, you have 15 minutes of, of not doing anything or? No, 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 okay. no. Everything I do is I try to make all mashups. So first, when I look at Ultra, I start two weeks in advance. Then we also had the, the live thing. Uh, actually I actually have a record coming out this Friday called No Tomorrow with uh, Belly and OT Genesis. Yay! Plug. Plug Which right we here. performed live at Ultra. To do all that live stuff in that hour and to also make sure that production is on point, that we have enough uh, special effects to make sure that everything is right i need to prepare with the whole team and those people need to know when they need to run on stage so for that hour everything is completely prepared every mix every mashup every acapella i have everything ready and then i have to cut it up and then you take it back you put it on usb plug and you play by order so it's the simplest thing when it comes down to djing but the preparation of it is like a whole nother level. You are still working on stage. You are not just pushing buttons. No, okay. but it, the thing is that like a lot of people do not understand when it comes down to this kind of preparation. This, this is my way of working. There's other people that have a full set list into Ableton and that's their show. Like, I'm not going to say like they're not DJs or like whatever the perception of DJ is. But that's not the DJing that you and I come from. That's not the actual form of mixing and BPM matching, etc., etc. But when you're looking at current technology, you have to think about how far is pre-mixed or not. Of course, doing like putting a mix on for one hour, that's bull****. But how far can you go in your preparations? You can make cue points, you can make loop points, you can already know the BPMs. 
is it bad to use syncing if you also know that 0.8% plus on a 128 BPM record makes it a 129 BPM record? That's another this story. Is, we can pretend not to know and just freestyle, which is what I do at clubs because then I can actually do fun DJing. But for the live shows, when there's so many people coming and you have so many different kinds of crowds to cater to, I'd rather prepare something that everyone want to love and going to love with crazy mashups and crazy next level stuff they never heard before. Then just go there and figure it out. I was playing four decks, three records at the same time, a cappella, samples, loop, reloop, pitch up, whoop, echo, go, and three, two, one, go with the mic and then jump. Doing all that stuff. And the only thing I read back on 1001 track list is Afrojack mashup. Welcome to my life. With your DJ experience, obviously you know how to read a crowd. If I pre-plan stuff, I'll notice that if I'm in front of a crowd, the temperature is different, the crowd is different, mm -hmm. my decks are different, and that track at that time that I pre-planned doesn't work. Yes. You get that. I rarely misprepare because, of course, we do a lot of gigs. We pay close attention. I pay close attention to YouTube. I watch what other DJs are playing. I watch what's going on in America, what's going on in Europe. Nine out of the ten times, like, I don't have to change anything. But last year at Ultra, it started to rain. I was like, I had like all this stuff prepared. I was like, I can't. I like, I just can't. I'm supposed to. I might miss a record, but whatever. And then I played Rock the House, which was not planned at all. But like, that's where the DJing comes up. But uh, we can do that. Some people are not able to do this because they're not used to reading crowds and they just think we do the show and that's what it is. When I was 17, like I used to love the DJ skills, I used to love the productions and the records that certain people didn't have, certain people didn't have. You invited me to one of your shows, I was like, the DJing, going from that record to that record, mixing in what's gebeurd. Like, mixing in like weird records, like all these little tricks always excited me about DJing. But your fans will all appreciate you for it because you make it very known. My fans, I have 10% fans, the die hardcore that's watching right now, huh, thank you very much, that knows this. Then I have 90% fans, they have no clue what the hell's going on. They're like, that's Afrojack, ah, his music. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So when I'm going up there and preparing or not preparing, the only thing which always like has a pressure on me at all times is how do I make my hardcore fan base proud but still create something that is understandable for the basic Las Vegas crowd. People that are going for Vegas for the first time they just want to have a party, yeah, get drunk, yay. Sometimes I'm one of those guys too. I don't always go to the club to hear some next level DJing. Sometimes I just want to have a good party. Or if I would go see Zed, like I would expect a great, great, great show. Looking back at it from a 17 year old perspective, I mean, you were one of those 10%. I was one of those 10%, <laughs> exactly. If I would go to Tomorrowland and I wouldn't be in my position, I know how difficult it is to get there. I know how many people click the buy link when the tickets become available. It's millions of people. So if I would get a ticket, I would go see everything. And then when I would go see X1 and Grosso, I want them to play Reload. I'm going to sing along to the top of my lungs. And if they don't play the original drop, I'd get pissed off. Fair enough. Or if they would forget to play it, I would get pissed off. Uh-huh. I get you. So that's the 90% perspective. And then the 10% perspective would be me whining about people not DJing. <laughs> okay. So let, <laughs> so let me talk to this kid for a moment. <laughs> you coming up, you yeah. know, having done all of it and everything and then, you know, going up. So now you have kids that's, that are skipping that and that are pre-prepping their yeah. sets because they can't DJ. They're, they're not DJs. Is it okay for them to... Just like you prep sections of their sets. And do you think they're rightfully there? How about that? If you sell the tickets, you're rightfully there. It's a really simple business, business matter. A promoter needs to sell tickets to make money. Promoter books artists. If artist sells enough tickets, he's worth his money to the promoter. And the, the people that buy the tickets buy the tickets to see their favorite artist. But it needs to be really clear for all those DJ fans out there that actually care about DJ. These people are not necessarily DJs. What do you enjoy more? Is it the big shows or is it the impromptu club sets? Playing a really big stage, 
especially when you're talking about the major festivals because everyone's watching and they will talk about it for weeks after and everyone's watching the set later online you're not just performing for those people you're also performing for people that are watching the live stream and you're performing for the people that are going to be watching this you're not just djing one time you're djing the best of your possible ability ever at that time you have to <laughs> yeah. that's the pressure so when i'm there every time i take the mic i'm like i better not f up <laughs> i better not say something wrong everything is built on giving the greatest show ever and it happens to involve a little bit of djing but the djing amount is so tiny they're like anyone could do it and i can make it as live as possible like I can take a cappella off a mashup and then play it live. Look at me, I just played an a cappella over mashup, but I already planned it. Doesn't matter. Yeah. And then when it comes down to the club sets, there it's different because then you're playing for a thousand people. You can see everyone's faces, you can see everyone personally, and you can play whatever is right at that time. So then you're not focused on catering to millions of people, then you're focused on catering to those thousand people and only at that time. It's not recorded, it will not be seen again. It's just you and them. And that, for me, is way more fun. But I have to say, when I get to play a big festival and it's not recorded, that's also way more fun. Yeah, I and mean, it, that's it what I It makes it more say. personal, yeah. you know? Yeah. See, listening to this, I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried the art is getting lost. Or am I just getting old? You know, is there, is there an art still? Should we worry about the art? I think, like, the best thing would be to reinvent the art. And DJing in the club never over the last 10 years ever since i grew up in it didn't have that much to do with your kind of djing like the the things that this man is capable of guys <laughs> in order for an art to remain to remain relevant it needs to reinvent itself so you can tell me like when i'm looking at these scratch videos like i see the sickest stuff and the coolest creative ideas and then i see arab music like pounding on this like mpc and you're like wow and it's whatever the people want, whatever functions as entertainment and art, which will be respected. This was Afrojack in the vlog. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. He was keeping it super real. Let me know what you thought in the comments. I'm going to read the comments too. But I really wonder what you guys have to say about this and how you guys feel. Because everything I just said is my idea. I don't know if it's actually true. So tell us what you think. Shout out to Afrojack for coming really clean with all of us and uh, showing us how the really big DJs do that on the festival scene. My personal advice, and Afrojack has gone through this as well, learn the actual art of DJing. The reason why I do what I do is mainly because of the amazing fun I have. And uh, you know, I've been DJing for two decades now and it wouldn't be half as fun for me to have everything planned out you know, this is my taste, but to DJ on the fly, and you heard it in this vlog as well, is the best thing ever. I will show you some of that on the controller in my mind vlog next week. It will come this time, I promise. Hit that subscribe button and don't miss out. Catch you back here next week, and until then, L's up, race safely, and salute.